Welcome to Swipe. Here's what's in store for you this week. Connecting you now, we send Kit to get the lowdown on the American gadget replacing British payphones. Meanwhile, I find out how supermarket brands are using virtual reality to influence what you buy. And Kratos is back, but he needs to learn to control his anger. Can Simon help him calm down? Find out in our games review. Stay with us for all of that and more. First though, let's get a look at the tech stories that got us talking this week. A robot has taken less than nine minutes to complete one of the hardest jobs known to man, assembling a flat pack IKEA chair. A team of researchers from Singapore's Nanyang Technological University developed the robotic arms which have 3D eyes, nimble fingers and pressure sensors that control how much force they exert. Scientists have engineered an enzyme that eats plastic. It degrades the type of plastic that bottles are made from, the kind that can last for hundreds of years polluting our environment. Researchers at the University of Portsmouth and the US Department of Energy's National Renewable Energy Laboratory who made the discovery are hoping to now optimize it to use on an industrial scale. It's been called the fastest growing language in history, but are emojis damaging people's English skills? Research by YouTube shows nearly everyone surveyed agreed that there had been a decline in the correct use of English. It also found nearly three quarters of adults depend on emojis to communicate. And finally, an update on this previous Swipe story. Remember the virtual reality project for people with dementia that recreated the day of the Queen's coronation in VR? Well, the team behind the Wayback Project are now crowdfunding on Kickstarter to help them make their next memory film. This time, it'll be the lead up to the World Cup final in 1966. The series is designed to trigger memories and conversations in those living with Alzheimer's. Now, when was the last time you used one of these? If the answer's never, you're not alone. There used to be almost 100,000 of them across the country, and now there's fewer than half that number. But in an attempt to keep them relevant, BT has been replacing hundreds of them with high-tech versions from New York. Although not everybody is happy about that, as Kit has been finding out. But for this landmark, many people in remote communities would be shut off from the world. The way we communicate has been transformed since this ad was on our screens in the 1980s, and the phone box is no longer the essential daily tool it once was. So now hundreds are being replaced with something completely different. In the dead of night, a small army of workers are removing old boxes on street corners up and down the country, and BT has made a long-distance call to New York for its new model. They're called InLinks, an intersection, a firm backed by Google's owner Alphabet, has been replacing the Big Apple's payphones with them for the past two years. And they aren't really payphones at all, because they actually offer free calls and Wi-Fi, paid for by advertising. But for some, that offer has rung alarm bells. Come charge your phone and get some Wi-Fi. This group has campaigned against them because of concerns they gather too much personal data. Well, I do need to download something for a meeting later. The head of InLink UK, Matt Bird, told me he's keen not to repeat the same mistakes on this side of the Atlantic. We have no interest whatsoever of tracking individuals, whether it's on Wi-Fi or other means. So we, we, we care about utilising data for good. And that's about aggregated, anonymised, not about tracking individuals. So we, we have no interest in doing that. Um, I feel quite comfortable to stand here today and say that that's not our interest. That's not what we've been asked to do. And our business models were paid for by the advertising on the, me the main media screens, not from the individuals themselves. The technology in classic red phone boxes like this hasn't actually changed much since they were first introduced in the 1920s. But their futuristic replacement has been specifically designed so it can be adapted and evolved with new technology over time. And that's something that critics say we should be concerned about. Campaigners have been opposing some of the planning applications for the new kiosks in London. Ross Atkin, who designs street furniture, has concerns about how they could be adapted. I started to realise that these weren't just phone box replacements. They were actually an incredible sensor network that's being deployed through the city. There are going to be over 750 of these installed. And, um, and they've said that there are platforms that they're going to fill with more and more sensors. That's, you know, they've, they've been public about that. And so 
they're building this incredible data gathering network throughout the city, and yet people are treating them like, oh yeah, we're just replacing a phone box. With plans for almost a thousand inlinks on our pavements by the end of the year, you're likely to see one on a street corner near you very soon. And then you can make your own call on whether they're a data gathering foe or a fitting replacement for the good old phone box. Kit Bradshaw, Sky News. Have you ever wondered what goes on at a retail virtual reality lab? No, me neither. And then I found out what they are. It turns out these specialist labs are where retailers and brands figure out ways to influence our behavior when we're out shopping and encourage us to splash the cash. Here's how. Hi there. Hi, you must be Neil. Yes, how hi. How are you? Good to meet you. You too, hi. Come on Neil in. here is about to become a shopping guinea pig. He's been set a mission to buy a box of chocolates right, for his yeah. own special reason. It's my grand's birthday coming up, oh, actually, yeah. OK, brilliant. Well, that's perfect. So let's put this on your head. He'll be choosing his grand's chocolates in a virtual supermarket because the point of this task is to see how shoppers like Neil behave, what products attract them the most and how they respond to different store layouts. Products everywhere. There's products There's all, everywhere, like, it's yes. A real... yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> The feedback is valuable information for food and drink brands and retailers vying for your attention and ultimately your cash. You can pick up these products, just like you would in a normal store, actually look at them closely. You can see the prices, you can look at calorie content if he if mm. if um, wants to. And why is using a headset better than just watching Neil walk around a real life supermarket and seeing what he chooses? Yeah, well in a, in a real supermarket, you can only test what's in store actually at that time. And what you want to do if you're a brand or a retailer is test what's going to happen in the future. The new product launch you've got, the new packaging, the new design of the store. I mean, virtual reality, you could design multiple different new retail ideas. The other thing is, that what you can do with virtual reality is include eye tracking. Now, if we ask Neil afterwards what he did and what he saw, he's only going to remember certain things and he may not even notice what he actually looks at but the eye tracking will tell us exactly what he saw in store. They're also using heat mapping. Red marks the items most looked at by test shoppers. Behind a large pane of one-way glass, shopping behaviour expert Ivan is observing Neil's decision making. It's Ivan whose job it is to translate the results to the brand that wants to win your attention. What might a brand or a retailer actually do with the information they get there? What kind of changes would they make? They can really change anything they want to within the store environment. So they could look at where particular types of products are placed in the store. Should they be at the front of the store or the back of the store? If we know from his visual activity that he's more likely to see one colour versus another, we could change the packaging of the box to be that colour. We could be looking at what elements of the box he looks at. So it may not just be the colour. It might be the branding isn't big enough on it, or it could be that the messaging on there isn't clear enough for the shopper. So we can change all of those elements that potentially can drive how that product stands out at shelf. Hey, Neil. Hi there. Welcome back to reality. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did it feel anything like a real supermarket? Yeah, it did. Honestly? It re yeah, re it was really realistic. The biggest question that I'm thinking of right now is what are you going to get your grand for her birthday? Uh, not a box of chocolates, I think. Okay, At good. 99, she deserves something 99. a bit more than 99! Yeah. Wow! Brace yourselves now. There's a Spartan warrior fighting multiple enemies in this week's games review. And that's just the start. Here's Simon with his take on some of the latest releases. Can you kill something that big? God of War for the PlayStation 4 is the coming back of the franchise to the console and I'm happy to tell you not only is it a fantastic game in its own right but it's also one of the best games of the entire generation. I know you're a god. Not As ever you do step into the shoes of Kratos and like before the combat and the action and the adventure here are really good. Kratos is a really angry man, he just goes around and he's got loads of weapons and you just kill anything that comes at you. However it's very well developed and therefore you're going to enjoy yourself. The change this time around is that Kratos isn't by himself and he's got a child. Now while that doesn't really sound like God of War, the point is it's so emotional and it's so involving. By the time the end credits roll, you're genuinely going to have been sucked in by this and you're going to appreciate Kratos more as a character. That was clearly the idea here and I tell you, Sony's pulled it off wonderfully. It's so good. If you don't own a PlayStation 4 console but you like the sound of this, it's probably worth buying one because genuinely 
this could be one of the best games, not only of 2018, but maybe, just maybe, of all time. So in short, God of War is a very good video game. Yakuza 6, the song of life for the PlayStation 4, is another entry in the Yakuza franchise, and maybe even the last one. But if it is, Sega's done a great job with this. It's a very good video game, and all fans of the Yakuza franchise are going to be very pleased. If you've never played a Yakuza game before, it's your standard action-adventure experience. So you're going to be doing some combat, you're going to be doing some exploration, you're going to be doing some detective work, and you're going to be stepping into the shoes of Kazuma and just enjoying his story, really. But it's all very, very well told. It's all very to the point. It's all very straightforward. And while if you are a fan of the series, you may be getting a little bit bored. It does feel very similar to other games in the series. It's still good. They've still done a good job. And you're still going to have a good time. The best thing about Yakuza 6 as well is if you've never played any of the other games, while you do need to do a little bit of reading around this, you can play this as well, and Sega has deliberately done that. So, not only is it good for fans of the series, but it's accessible as well. And what more can you ask from that? Yakuza 6, a very good Yakuza game. MLB The Show 18 for the PlayStation 4 can actually be summed up in one single sentence, and that's this. It's the best baseball video game ever made. Now, while on the one hand, that's not actually that impressive because there aren't that many baseball games, I don't mean it like that, and I genuinely mean that in terms of a simulation of the sport, this couldn't be any better. And that's not just from the act of taking a bat and hitting a ball either. There's so much depth here and so many modes. If you like baseball, you could lose an entire year of your life to this, and you're never going to get bored of it. And yeah, there isn't too much of a difference between this year's game and the previous entry, but that's not the point, because what is here is really good. To sum it up, all I need to say is this. If you're a football fan, more often than you like FIFA, and if you're a baseball fan, more often than not, you're going to like MLB The Show. The 2018 version is great. Again, if you like baseball, go and get this. It's as simple as that. I promise you, you're going to have a good time with it. And if you don't, well, you probably don't like baseball. Well, that's it for this week's show. Don't forget to join us again for more Swipe next week. And in the meantime, why not follow us on Twitter, at Sky News Swipe. Then you can see what we get up to throughout the week. Bye-bye.